it is meant to ultimately be a hopeful service. So I, I hope you'll stay with me while, while we get there, okay? Because we've got to deal with some tough stuff first. And for those who might be visiting for the first time and not, not know anything about our, our religion, uh, uh, our religion is going through some, some con conflict, some controversy these days. And uh, I've, I've been in the midst of that, to say the least. And sometimes events uh, transpire that, that require me to address it before the congregation because I want our congregation to be informed about some things that are going on. So this sermon will be a little more esoteric today than, than sometimes, but uh, I think it will also give you an opportunity to understand more about what, what we are about in addition to what we're going through. So to begin with, as I think most of you know, after giving away less than 200 copies of my book, you can do the math here, less than 200 copies of my book, The Gadfly Papers, at the 2019 Unitarian Universalist General Assembly, I was immediately banned from returning to the assembly, I mean, after just four hours. And within 24 hours, I was publicly condemned in two letters signed by over 300 UU ministers, calling me and my book racist, homophobic, and transphobic, ableist, and classist, without citing a sentence from it. Within a month, I was fired as an adjunct professor from Meadville Lombard Theological School, where I earned my doctorate. The uh, Unitarian Universalist Ministers Association publicly censured me. A year later, I was disfellowshipped from the UUA's Ministerial Fellowship Committee, and today the association has me listed on its website as an abusive bully who is ethically unfit for ministry. Sadly, I am not the first, nor even the most recent minister to endure such treatment. In 2018, Reverend Richard Trudeau raised similar concerns as, as mine, concerns as mine on social media. I have reservations about the current UU racial justice ideology, he said, and I'd like to find a place to discuss them with colleagues of all races. Only a few days later, he received a letter of censure insinuating that by merely questioning the UUA's particular approach to racial justice and anti-oppression, he had violated their code of ethics. And just a few weeks ago, Reverend Kate Rohde, a retired UU minister, was formally disfellowshipped in response to personal opinions that she expressed on social media. The UU Association's notice on the matter accused her of defaming colleagues without saying how and of refusing repeated attempts to call her back into covenant that she categorically denied the validity of any and all claims made, and that the Ministerial Fellowship Committee was unable to find an avenue for reconciliation or meaningful remediation. And I take this to mean that Rhodey refused to confess her sins and recant. She was disfellowshipped according to their own explanation for continuing to disagree with them. Now, I begin with these examples not to incite outrage, but to make the point that in today's Unitarian Universalist Association, disagreeing with the, uh, with the authorities is no longer permitted. Those who do will find themselves shamed and silenced at best, and have their reputations destroyed and their livelihoods ruined at worst. Tragically, such suppression and the resulting conflict is also occurring in many of our congregations. Some individuals and small groups want to talk about their concerns, but are being forbidden from doing so by their ministers, their boards, and some of their own members from doing so. Many congregations are losing members as a result. Members who understandably choose to simply walk away rather than to put up with what has become the antithesis of the free religion we once knew. And this is a sad state, if not an end, for liberal religion in North America, which was formalized almost 200 years ago with the establishment of the American Unitarian Association, the AUA, in 1825. But got its 
unofficial start nearly a century before then. That's when Reverend Charles Chauncey, minister of Boston's First Church, began preaching that human beings are born with the capacity for both sin and righteousness. That there is good in us. An idea that was initially called Arminianism, but eventually came to be called Unitarianism. Prior to this, well actually I should say a hundred years later, Chauncey's Congregational Church was officially named a Unitarian Church. And prior to this, King's Chapel, the first Anglican church in colonial America, established in Boston in 1686, installed a Unitarian minister, James Freeman. That was in 1782, making it the oldest Unitarian church in the nation. And the oldest pilgrim church in the U.S., founded in Plymouth in 1620, became a Unitarian church in 1802. Our religion has been here since the founding of this nation, promoting and demonstrating our belief in human goodness and potential and the virtues of freedom and reason and tolerance. So tolerant are we that unlike so many other religions that continue to fracture, we formed an association with another religion, universalism in 1961. And until very recently have been almost defined by this extraordinary ability to get along exceedingly well, despite our many differences. As the renowned Unitarian Universalist minister Jack Mendelssohn said in 1964, in a Unitarian Universalist congregation, an agnostic may sit beside one who believes in a personal God. At the after-service coffee hour, a believer in reincarnation may stand chatting with one who affirms utter extinction. Such are the diversities in theological belief. Yet today, the infectious intolerance and dogmatism that began in Boston is spreading to our congregation and is tearing them apart anywhere there is resistance to this loss of freedom and reason and tolerance that had defined our liberal religion for almost 300 years. Again, as Mendelssohn put it, the most fundamental of all Unitarian Universalist principles is personal freedom and religion, religious belief. The principle of the free mind. No holy writ dictates, no creed dictates that must be believed. Today, this is no longer the case marking the end of an era for religious freedom and liberalism in North America. Along with the loss of personal freedom and our religion and the worth and dignity of every person that went with it is the loss of our collective freedom to express ourselves through legitimate democratic processes. One of the UUA's seven principles its fifth principle is the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at large. Yet for more than a decade, the systems that once kept our congregations democratically engaged with the association have been eliminated and decision-making power has been consolidated into the hands of a very few people in Boston at our Boston headquarters. Not long ago, the UUA Board of Trustees had dozens of members elected by UUs in districts all over the country. Today, there are seven trustees hand-selected by a committee. As recently as the 2016 General Assembly in Columbus, Ohio, as the UU Association's moderator announced plans to transform our liberal religion into a covenantal one, he also said, district leaders are imagining other ways of shaping governance. Three districts in the Midwest consolidated into one region two years ago, and eight districts in the South and Central Northeast have voted to dissolve and defer governance to the UUA. 
It doesn't get any clearer than that. The new vision is to defer governance of our congregations to the UUA. Today, what many of us would consider democratic elections of leaders is practically non-existent in the UUA. As in Russia and other authoritarian regimes, we are asked to vote in elections in which the outcomes have already been predetermined by the powers that be. The most alarming example of this regards the UUA's presidential election. Until recently, its presidential search committee was re required to present delegates with, two or, or delegates with two or more candidates, while others could choose on their own to run by petition, which required the support of only 25 congregations. There was no restriction on when one could begin gathering these petitions. So if you know you want to run two years in advance, you could start gathering petitions. That's the way it has been. But this began to change in 2018 when the UUA Campaign Elections Committee issued a report stating, we recommend that the bylaw that allows for running for president by petition be eliminated. 9.6a as it pertains to the office of president. In the absence of the will to eliminate this bylaw completely, we believe that the threshold for petition candidates should be raised significantly to at least 50 congregations from at least two regions and certifiable only by the action of duly called congregational meetings. Failing to eliminate this option completely, the bylaws were changed in 2019, doubling the number of petitions necessary to 50 petitions from three regions across the U.S. Petitions that must be formally approved in a church board meeting or during a special congregational meeting. Now this seems an almost insurmountable barrier, but there have, again, never been any restrictions on how early a candidate can begin seeking petitions. At least not until earlier this year, when I informed our congregation of my intention to begin seeking petitions to be on the ballot this June. Within just a few days, the election committee contacted me in a terse email falsely claiming I had violated their rules by campaigning before November 15th, when they would officially announce their chosen candidates. And this is patently untrue. The bylaws clearly separate the petitioning process from the campaigning process and always have. Meanwhile, the deadline for turning in one's petitions is February 1st, which means petitioners now have only two and a half months to convince, contact and convince, you can't mention it before, right? February, before November 15th. So, to contact and convince 50 congregations from around the country to hold special meetings to approve a petition to have them placed on the ballot. Given the requirements most congregations have around holding special congregational meetings, petitioning to get on the ballot has become impossible, which is what the committee expressly wanted to begin with. Additionally, just last year, the UUA asked delegates to approve a change to the bylaw requiring the Presidential Search Committee to submit no fewer than two nominations. They can submit more if they wanted to, which would make it really democratic, but, but no fewer than two. They wanted to change that language to state one or more. By having effectively eliminated petition candidates, this would have allowed them to put forward a single presidential candidate. And this move finally proved to be a bridge too far for the General Assembly delegates last year who voted it down, meaning the committee is still required to put forward no fewer than two candidates. Nevertheless, on November 15th, about two weeks ago, the UUA announced a single candidate for the position explaining that one of their nominees declined the nomination. But once the nominations were made, the committee determined that the only fair and appropriate course of action was to move forward with the nomination. 
of their chosen delegate rather than reopening the application process. A clear violation of their own bylaws, reaffirmed by the delegates just a year ago. Their excuse is nonsense for many reasons and has prompted much concern about the UUA's blatant violation of its own bylaws and disregard for even a pretense of democracy. In a recent campaign statement, the presidential appointee said, I am currently the only nominee in the election process, though others may run by petition. In another recent communication, the current UUA president also said, we do have a petition process and have put out information about how candidates can run by petition. Good, I'll get right on that. So under the circumstances, these overtures to democracy sound completely hollow and insult our intelligence. Persecuting those who assert their freedom of speech and actively undermining our commitment to democracy is happening in clear violation of our seven principles outlined in Article 2 of the UUA bylaws, which have become problematic. These seven principles, which for many have defined our religion, have become problematic for those involved in this hostile takeover of our liberal religion. This is especially so of the first principle, respect for the inherent worth and dignity of every person. The fourth principle, a free and responsible search for truth and meaning, and as mentioned, the fifth principle, the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at large. For we cannot censure, silence, and persecute others if we respect them their freedoms, and their right to self-determination. Nor can we claim to be democratic when we put systems in place that help a handful of individuals determine who will and won't be elected. So the UUA's Article 2 Study Commission recently released a proposal to eliminate the seven principles altogether and to replace them with seven words, which they refer to as our shared values. The words include love, love at the center of the diagram, surrounded by pluralism, interdependence, equity, generosity, justice, and evolution, the latter of which is not a principle, it's a process. But this is the euphemism for accepting what's going on, right? We're evolving. That's where that's coming from. More importantly, the words that really have defined, defined the core of our religion all these years are absent. Freedom, democracy, independence. Fortunately, these changes will have to be approved by the delegates by delegates at a general assembly and have only been released for prior consideration. Even so, it does not appear that genuine feedback about them is truly welcome. An attendee of one such meeting recently reported the UUA is conducting feedback sessions in tightly controlled formats that limit the feedback that you use hear from each other. He further explained that there were no questions allowed and no requests for overall opinions about the changes. <coughs> and all of this gets back to my main point. Those of us troubled by what's happening to our religion are not bothered by the beliefs of those responsible. We are simply and gravely disturbed that we have been silenced. Simply wishing to discuss our concerns immediately gets us condemned 
is racist, homophobic, transphobic, ableist, classist, and any other modern version of the word heretic that can be, get, that can be thrown at us. And we can live with our ideological differences. That's the Unitarian way. But we cannot live with being silenced or being part of a religion that is regressing into old patterns of religious intolerance, extremism, and authoritarianism. Again, I want everyone to hear me on this. Those who agree with me and those who don't. My issue with the Unitarian Universalist Association is not their ideology, as much as I might disagree with some of it. My issue is that they are using their positions of power to silence those they disagree with. It is the UUA that refuses to openly and sincerely engage, to engage with us in mutual settings, not tribunals. Don't call me to a tribunal, and when I refuse to accept your authority over me, tell me that he won't engage. I'll be happy to engage. And this really is the truly unethical, abusive, and bullying behavior. <coughs> Yet, this is not meant to be a you've done enough, have you no sense of decency at long last, have you left no sense of decency moment. As it was when attorney Joseph Welch spoke these words during the McCarthy hearings. On the contrary, as difficult as it is to hear about what's going on to our beloved and beleaguered religion, as difficult as it is, as it is for some of us to relive these injustices, myself included, this is meant to be an uplifting message. We'll get there. We'll get there. <laughs> as we are now ready to consider the power that we have to adequately address and meet this challenge. Our first advantage is that our congregations remain autonomous organizations independent of the Unitarian Universalist Association. I said independent, not interdependent. I know some of you out there are members of congregations that are in conflict over these matters. And I also know how difficult that is to endure. All of us here do. Especially when your ministers and your church leaders are suppressing freedom and democracy in the congregation that you have loved, that you have been part of, and that you have helped build and support. That's tough. But even if your church isn't able to assert its collective independence at this time, you still have yours as individuals, and that is what keeps you free. And that is where your greatest strength lies. The other great advantage we have is each other. The UUA may have abandoned its liberal members and its liberal heritage, but we have not abandoned each other. Our association may have become authoritarian, but we remain free. It may not be willing to hear us, but we can continue to speak. So we need no longer concern ourselves with turning the UUA around. It is not necessary. In the past, the UUA was but our service organization, our service organization that we funded as its bylaws still state. We funded it so that we can collectively support each other with the ne necessary services we occasionally need. This too is something that we can continue doing because all that is required for doing so is our independence and our continued connection to each other, which we have. So let's stop wasting time and energy hoping to change the UUA and focus instead on what we really need and on our ability to support each other. The first thing we need 
is to regularly be reminded that we are not alone in the world and that we remain part of something meaningful that is larger than us and our local congregations. We need to remain part of a liberal religion with a rich history, deep roots, and essential values. We also need an organization wherein we are free to speak and think for ourselves and are never censured or punished or ostracized for doing so. That's how we thrive. We need to be part of a community in which we can be great friends with people who have different ideas and identities than our own. Just as Jack Mendel, Mendelssohn described us in 1964. We also need liberal ministers, which means a new way we need a new way of identifying and certifying those we call to occupy our pulpits. Finding a UU minister who is truly liberal is the number one concern I hear from congregations in search these days. We need information, genuine information like newsletters that aren't filled with propaganda and euphemisms, and an independent magazine that includes letters to its editors, including letters expressing dissent and dissatisfaction. We need classes and curriculum that remind us who we are and where we come from, and religious education that exposes our children and our youth to our cherished liberal values. We need activities that bring us together, including conferences, district meetings, and worship services that make use of the technologies enabling us to include members throughout North America and anywhere else. And we need to reestablish democracy in our dealings with each other by putting a ballot inside every inbox of any member of our association. We have the technology to do that today. We don't have to leave it up to a fraction of a percentage point to make our decisions for us. So today, because we have these needs, and because we have each other, and because we have the freedom to do so, I'm excited to announce the formation of the North American Unitarian Association that very shortly will include individuals and congregations from the U.S and Canada as members. Those of us working toward its creation, including two members from our local congregation's board of trustees and a member of our shared ministry team, along with others from both countries, have been working swiftly to make this happen. But given the mounting upset regarding recent developments concerning the seven principles and the UUA's presidential election process, we felt it necessary to get ahead of ourselves just a little to help alleviate some of the concern, the mounting concern, and redirect it into a positive direction. I want to also make it very clear that the NAUA is not meant to replace the UUA. I still believe the UUA will eventually turn around because I believe it's going down a flawed course that will end in ruin. But this will require new leadership and enough time for them to affect real change. And according to my estimates, based on our election cycles, we won't see anything like this happening until at least 2035, at the earliest. In the meantime, we have immediate and practical needs that must be attended to in order for us to thrive again as religious liberals. So I want to encourage our congregation and other congregations to remain part of the UUA so we can use what little voice we have left to help restore it to the open-minded, open-hearted religion that it is meant to be. And I would be very proud if our Spokane congregation becomes a founding member of the NAUA, but this one's not up to me. It will be up to our board of trustees in consultation with our members. But for now, we can feel good and hopeful about the future of liberal religion again, as together we rebuild the relationships and supports 
that have sustained us in North America for almost three centuries, bound by our shared commitment to reason, freedom, and tolerance. Thank you. Well, can't you just let everyone stand up and applaud first and then? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Yeah, no. I'm a supporter of you. I yeah. have one serious question. Okay. Rumor has it the board has already voted to join this new organization. And if that is true, does that not violate the same principle of a small group deciding for the entire rather than it coming before the whole congregation? Absolutely. That's why you should never listen to rumors. So not of course not. Can you repeat what she said? Yeah, the, she, 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 she had heard a rumor that the board of trust, our, our board of trustees has already approved this and have voted, voted to approve this and that that would be a violation of the very democratic principles I'm talking about. Yeah. yeah. No. No. Thank you. What an opportunity to squelch a rumor. <laughs> right? Right at the start of this. Uh, any, uh, uh, maybe I'll do one or two more questions if, if there's anything pressing. If not, we'll... Yeah, Don. Uh, have you gotten a, a feedback or is this like uh, the principal people that are on the internet a lot and discussing things? Or no, uh, 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 you have other, other feedback other? about the NAUA? Yeah. No, we, we've, we've not been making any public statements about it uh, because... Uh, you know, we're, we're in very, very early stages. We're trying to, to formalize it with document, with the right documents and articles of incorporation and those yeah, sort of things. Well, no, uh, we have a group, and that is uh, some members of our congregation, and including members of our board. We've been reporting on it at the board meetings during the past two months, uh, three months now, I guess, and. Uh, we have members from Canada and members from the south part of the U.S. and from the west side, and so it's a small sort of task task force right now that's just trying to to formalize the organization. So, yeah, and then oh, we got one here, and then Tom. Yes, go ahead. Uh, so is the NAUA seeking to censor the UU seven principles and the is the UUA uh, thinking of centering the seven principles as its, as its guiding ideals? Uh, no, and, I, and I'll tell you why. Uh, uh, a couple of years ago, there was a, a congregation in Austin, Texas that split uh, over this issue. The splinter group in that case uh, were, were the dissenters, and they formed a, a congregation of their own. They called it the uh, UU Church of the Seven Principles. Uh, now, there are lots of congregations that start that are you call themselves UU churches that that aren't official and they've been unharassed but they received a letter from the UUA uh, claiming they were violating cop, uh, trademark issues and they couldn't refer to seven principles a chalice or even use the term Unitarian Universalism so but what this group will really do is is go back to I, I think those fundamental principles of freedom reason and tolerance and if you, if you go and look at those seven principles, you, those seven principles are really uh, an, art, an articulation of those enlightenment values, right? There, there's actually a whole evolution of, of, of statements of faith that were made over time, and they keep changing. And those seven principles, which were adopted in 1985, are, are the latest in, incarnation of those. But they're, they're rooted in something much deeper. So, But certainly those seven principles will be held close to our hearts. Okay, Tom, and then, and then we'll just do one more, and then we'll, we're going to have actually a meeting, I think, on the 14th. Is that right? On Wednesday the 14th in the evening, we'll, we'll let you know more about that. But for now, I'll let Tom have the last question. Uh, just, a, just a statement. Um, as you and I discussed earlier, uh, there's a lot of people that are concerned about the Constitution, and I think you and I should Thank you, Tom. Thank you for your generosity. That that will be helpful. Helpful.
He said he's, he's committed to, uh, to contribute 500 hours to the cause whenever we're ready to accept that to help as seed money. So oh. that's helpful because we've been spending lots of seeds. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest one was a trademark, you know, getting, getting things trademarked. But by the way, Unitarian Universalism is trademarked too. Now, Unitarianism and Universalism are separate entities, but combined it's a, it's a trademark. So that's why we call it the NAUA. But we will, we will include members who are Unitarians, comma, Universalists, comma, and other religious liberals. Okay? Okay, so I'm so sorry. We probably should, should move on because there's cookies awaiting. <laughs> but we'll, we'll, we're going to have an official meeting on this uh, coming up later this month, and I'll, I'll look forward to helping to answer whatever questions I can. So thank you all so much. Do you want to stand and give me a finish? Do you want to finish it? No, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. We were so rudely um, interrupted from that standing ovation. I'm teasing. Um, and given the, given the time, why don't we rise and sing shalom? And please uh, do hands if you'd like to do that. Well, we'll also have the benediction too. And sing oh, that, that's true. You benediction first, then. Right. Yeah. So. Are we going to sing a song, other song other than that? No, you can just Okay. No, let's not. Okay. Out of our business, busyness, we are called back into balance, back into ourselves and the silence of our present being. We are called to remember our relationships and our dependencies. We are called to once again feel the oneness which sustains our being in balance with creation and to do so with wonder and appreciation. Amen. Blessed be, salam alaikum, and shalom. <laughs>